purpose. Uh, maybe someone else will pick it up. Um, now, uh, let's see. We've got our savings. I mean, our, our valuing our money. That's critical. The, the, the skill number two was what? Yeah, controlling that money as it flows through. I've got to control it. The third skill is to save that money. And these things are fundamentals. We all heard this thing a million, a million times, but most of us don't know why you save. And we don't understand the value of saving. You save just a dollar a day. You invest that at 10, 15, or 20 percent. By the time you reach that 65 years, 66 years old, you have a million dollars. You have two million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to all the way up to a billion dollars. So this gives you an incentive for saving. It's critical. Now, what do I do with that money when I've saved it? See, what do I, when I've saved, saved it, and I've got a bank account with money sitting in it, what do I do with it then? Got to invest it. Now, investing is different than saving. And investing is different than making money. Investing is a special skill that everyone here in the room needs, no matter how much money you are making at your regular business. It used to be that I had, well, I've had many, many businesses over my, my career. I've owned, uh, well, when we hit our best-selling books, I went out and bought all kinds of different businesses. I bought a chocolate factory, which is the first thing I thought of once I made lots of money. <laughs> You know, your, your wants do multiply, and you get what you really want, right? Uh, my wife bought a, a clothing store. We, we, uh, we went and invested into a Broadway play uh, so that we could be there on opening night, and I still get little dribbles of income from that Broadway play. I invested in the Utah Jazz. I became an owner of the professional basketball team, the Utah Jazz. That was a lot of fun. I could sit on the front row and get the best seats in the house, and... It was a very wonderful experience. I absolutely loved it. I invested in uh, several other businesses that didn't do very well. You know, kind of went down the drain. So I've had a lot of experience making and making and losing, and some sometimes making money. Um, I always used to have this opinion that you know, if a, a business person is going to invest invest his or her money, that they should make huge rates of return. That's why I always like real estate, because you can get you know, hundred, two hundred, three hundred percent on your money. I can invest twenty-five thousand dollars in in cash to buy a foreclosure property and get seven hundred, or I mean, get seventy-five or one hundred thousand dollars back, you know, in a, in a year period of time if I looked really carefully. So I get high rates of return. When I compared that to the rates of return from the stock market, I always, and this is of course before nineteen eighty-nine, I always would say, well, why would anybody put their money in the stock market, or in mutual funds, or in a savings account, or in certificates of deposit? If you could make two, three hundred percent on your money, why would you ever put your money in those other kinds of investments that are more traditional? And that was a huge mistake on my part. Because I didn't realize that there were two skills. See, I thought there was just making money, which is skill number five. I hadn't thought that skill number four, which is investing money, which, is, which was essential to my investing and my business life. And it is to you, too. Even if you're a business person, you're making lots of money at your business, you also have to have on the side your investments to go along with it. And I'll show you why. Suppose you, uh, well, let's just take real estate for instance. Let's suppose you do really well. You buy a copy of Nothing Down or you go to one of my five-day seminars and you just go crazy with real estate and you're doing incredibly well. And uh, let's say by the year 2000 you want to retire and it gives you four or five years to get there and you make that $5 million net worth of yours, all right? So you got five million bucks in real estate. What are you going to do with it? Suppose you just want to retire and, you know, have the money coming in on interest. You don't want to have to hassle with the properties any longer. So you go sell all the properties. And let's suppose you got your five million dollars in, 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 after taxes. That was five million dollars coming into. Well, actually, well, there's, let's, let's be realistic here. Going to have to pay taxes on that, so it's going to wipe out probably 40% of it at least. So i got $3 million left over, and I'm going to put it in a bank account somewhere. I'm going to have that earn money from me, right? Let's see, well, how much uh, would $3 million in a bank earn me if I wanted to retire? If it's a 3% interest, 3% on $3 million, how much a year? Yeah, it's about $90,000, $100,000 a year, and uh, is that wealth? If you've got $3 million in a bank, $90,000, $100,000, that might not be too bad. That's, let's see. How much is that per month? 
Eight thousand a month. Okay, eight thousand a month. Is that all tax free? Because this is interest, isn't it? So I'm going to have to pay taxes on that. So eight thousand a month. I got to wipe, wipe out half of that for interest and on my tax taxes on my interest. So I'm going to down about four thousand a month. Now that doesn't even make the payment on that nothing down million dollar mansion that you had there. For. So four thousand a month is really not all that hot, is it? So what are you going to do? See, you've got three million dollars in the bank, and you're really only netting about four grand a month. That's if your money's growing at 3%. You're going to have to make it grow higher, aren't you? So what are you going to do? You're going to walk down to your local stockbroker, bring in $3 million in cash. Hi, I've worked five years of my life to get this together. I want to give it to you because I know you know what you're doing. <laughs> you take my money and make it grow at bigger rates of return. Is that what you're going to do? You feel real comfortable about that, aren't you? No. As soon as you lose control of your money, you, you lost. It's a real secret. You don't, you don't lose control of your money. You've got to know where it is. You've got to know who's managing it, you know, what the rates are, where they're investing it, etc. You never turn over your money to somebody else and let them watch it for you. Period. You have to know what's happening to it. Well, you could get your money to grow at 5% interest by just giving it to the government, and they'll give you a nice uh, bond. You can probably get 7% on that if you wanted to. And in some instances, you probably get some tax-free money on that, 5, 6, 7% tax-free. That's pretty good. So I'm making seven, dollars $8,000 a month. But if you want to get to 10%, hmm, now that starts to get a little tricky. I get 10% of my money, I have to give it to somebody else who knows what they're doing, and I've got to watch over their shoulder. If I want to get it to 12 and 13 and 15%, that's, that's also very tricky. See, see, if I'm making 10% on my money, Three million dollars. That's three hundred thousand dollars a year. Now I'm starting to get where I could really probably live on that. I'd probably be okay. The point is, there's going to come a time in your life, Mr. Business Person, where you'll have a chunk of stuff to invest, and I'm going to ask you where you're going to put it and who you're going to give it to. And if you're like a good entrepreneur, you're going to have to watch over that just like you did with your business or you're going to have some troubles down the road. So I'm going to challenge you that you have to do it as you go along, not waiting until the end to learn it. And I want you to have some experience investing in the stock market, investing in mutual funds and things like that, because I want you to experience it every single month, almost every single day. As you're watching TV, you're watching in the side of your corner of your ear, you're listening. What did the Dow Jones do today? You know, did it go up? Did it go down? How much of my money's in there? You may only have $500 in there, but I want you to know by experience the feeling of what it's like when you've got your old money lying on the line here because that, that teaches you how to take care of it. If you wait till the end to invest your money, you will not have that savviness that comes from watching even subliminally where your money is growing. You got that? Now, let's suppose on the other side of the coin, that by the year 2000, you lost everything. You put everything you got into this business of yours. You put everything into it, and, and it, darn it, you just didn't make it. So by the year 2000, you're out. You're, you're done. You're going to start from scratch. You may be even deep in, the, deep in the hole. If you hadn't taken 10% or 5% of your money and stuck it aside for what we call our long-term investment process, you wouldn't have money to kickstart yourself with. You would have just spent it. You would have poured it back into your business thinking that's what you needed to do. And so from both standpoints, if you make it big or even if you lose it all, you need to have that investing part that goes in there. Now, where should you put your money? How do you get your money to grow? Where should you put it? There are lots of traditional ways of investing our money. And I want you to explore all of them, all right? So let's start over here with what we call taking stock consistently. Secret number four, 10 rules of investment. Warren Buffett, our richest man in America when it comes to investing in the stock market, says, I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman. And I'm a better businessman because I'm an investor. Most people really don't understand that statement. They think they're both the same. Business, investing, what I've tried to delineate for you here is they are two different skills. He says, I run a business. I'm an entrepreneur. But I'm a better entrepreneur because I know how my money grows in the stock market. And I'm also a better investor in the stock market because I know how hard it is to make that money grow when I'm an entrepreneur. And so the skills work together with each other. 
So we're going to talk about what I call the 10 rules of investments because I am going to challenge everybody here in the room starting next Monday morning to call up whatever local stockbroker turns you on or whatever local uh, mutual fund company turns you on from calling whatever 800 number they've got in ma Money Magazine from there to somebody that you know uh, locally that handles these kinds of things. And I'm going to challenge you to, to cause them to set up an automatic debit out of your bank account and to have them pull money out of your account every single month with your permission. I would rather you bounce checks to the grocery store than you miss that particular uh, account that comes out of you every single month. Some of you already do this. And more and more people are doing it because the benefits are really obvious. How many of you are consistent month by month, every single month, investors in mutual funds? Can I see raise hands on that? Okay, we've got about 40% of you. I want 100% of you to do that. And I want them to take it right out of your bank account. Um, some of you are just beginners, and so you don't know where to start. Uh, we have this thing called the stock market. And um, what they sell on the stock market are stocks and bonds and mutual funds. We'll cover that briefly. What I'm going to talk about when it comes to the stock market are some rules that I want all of you to learn. And that is, you can't time the market. So don't try. Time the market. If anybody comes up to you and says, this is the best time to buy this thing. It's going to go through the roof. Be very, very careful. You never invest more than maybe 10% of your investment funds in some risky thing like that. You never put all your money into one basket. Now, what I mean by time the market is that, frankly, nobody knows when the stock market is going to go up and when it's going to go down. And you especially don't know that. Neither do I, especially, because I don't spend my life studying it. But there are guys and gals right now on Wall Street who literally spend 21 hours a day in this thing. They, they manage various funds. It is their entire life. They get up in the morning and they wake, uh, every waking hour is spent studying the stock market, studying mutual funds, studying the ups and the downs and all the rules. You cannot in your entire lifetime ever catch up to them. So don't try. Now, of all these guys and gals in Wall Street that are trying to spend their whole life studying it, what percentage of them are really successful? Well, all the mutual funds that have been, you know, mushroomed in the last five, ten years. There's six or seven thousand different mutual funds all concentrating on the same three thousand stocks. What percentage of those people are really making great returns? About twenty percent of them. And the other eighty percent will be, put your money in the bank and you'll be just fine. About twenty percent of them are doing it. And these are people who spend their entire life at it. How could you even come close? You can't. So don't, don't try. Don't even try. There are some things that you can do, and many of you understand these things. I'm going to be teaching you today. There are things that you can do as an illiterate, ignorant stock market investor. I'm going to put myself in that category. I don't purport to know an awful lot about the stock market. I do know a few principles that really work for the average person, which I am when it comes to the stock market. You bring me into real estate, oh, I'm not average. You bring me into starting my own business, I'm not average. But you get me investing in the stock market, I'm just a run-of-the-mill person. So number two, don't buy blank, buy blank with blank, blanky blank, blank, blank. Okay? If I am going to invest in the stock market, if I do pick a few stocks there that I want to put my money into, first of all, I want to take my little chunks of money, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, and spread it up into several little pieces. You very rarely want to put all of your money into one stock. But the key is you're not investing in stocks. I think you should just throw that kind of concept out the window. And the way Buffett talks about it, he says, I don't buy stocks. I don't buy pieces of paper. I buy, this is, don't buy stocks is, is the blank here. Don't buy stocks. Buy great, and this is actually a quote from Buffett, buy great blank. Buy great companies. I'm going to buy a company, not a stock. With solid market dominances. 
and stick with them as long as they are great. Dominances. Don't buy stock. Buy great companies with solid market dominances and stick with them until they're great. Let's look at some of the stocks that, um, that Warren Buffett himself has bought over the last uh, 15 years or so. Anybody know some of the stocks he's got in his portfolio? Gillette. Gillette, right? Gillette. Does Gillette have a solid market dominance? Yeah, in terms of male uh, products? Yes, definitely. Give me another solid Coca company. Coca-Cola. Does Coca-Cola have a solid market dominance all over the world? Yeah, and it's something that people, anybody can understand that. Give me another one that he might have purchased. Pardon me? Kleenex. I'm not sure, is this one of the one of, uh, Buffett's? But well, there's, there's one, there's Kleenex, and some basic things. Uh, Microsoft would be something where probably over a long period of time would have a solid market dominance. Yep, yeah. Disney would probably have a solid market dominance over a long period of time. He's also bought uh, C's Candies, and I've become to appreciate that particular investment more and more. He also uh, just bought outright a company called Geico Insurance, which has a solid market dominance in what it focuses on. In other words, he just takes lots of his money and focuses on a few very key uh, investments. It's the same thing you should do. If you've ever had an interest in the stock market, you should read a couple of books about Warren Buffett because he does it in the whole aspect of wealth. He does it all right. The way, he, the way he invests his money, the way he lives his life is pretty much the way I think most of us should be doing it. Number three, the key is blank. Like automatic monthly investments. The technical term for this is blank, blank, blank. The key is Consistency. Consistency. Every month, without fail, never miss a month, consistently make your automatic monthly investments. The technical term for this is dollar cost averaging. Now, how many of you have never heard those three words before or never understood them? Dollar cost averaging. Let me see everybody's hands on that. Dollar cost averaging. Uh, let me show you a chart that really was stunning to me the first time I saw it. And it really taught me what this really means when I, when I say um, dollar cost average and the difference. I'm going to show you two stocks. I'm going to show you one. Um, actually, we're going to take two funds, which uh, a mutual fund is just a, a group of stocks that some person has selected out of the stock market and put them together in what they call a fund. Here are two Two stocks, funds. Uh, I'm going to put that over to the side like that in that way. Let me try it this way. <laughs> try that. Okay, here's fund A, and this is fund B. Fund A, they're going to make a, a monthly uh, investment every single month, right? So today I'll buy $100 worth of fund A. Next month I buy $100. And the month after that I buy $100. And the month after I buy $100. And $100 and $100 and $100. Okay? And this is fund B. And every month I buy $100. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Which of those funds would the average person be excited to own? A. A. Why? It's a consistent winner. Makes nice amounts of money over quite a long period of time. They're really happy with that. And yet, which one makes the most money? Yeah, I was at $100 a month. Here's where they both fit. This fund A would make you $1,435 in your first year. This would make you $2,230 in your first year. Now, why is that? Because if you buy every single month, even if you buy and it's going down, this is where it takes a uh, little nerves of steel because the beginners hate to put their money in something that's going down in value. But what you're doing is you're buying those stock funds cheaper. You're getting discounts on them, basically, is what you're getting. Woo, good, it's going down. I'm getting discounts. Woo-hoo, yee Oh, now this is kind of scary because, I don't know, maybe it'll go down to zero. Then you'll end up with a lot of really worthless stock, won't you? Yeah, but over a long period of time, what might happen with that fund? It pops up a little bit, even if it comes up less than what I bought the first amount of shares for, see? 
What did you buy your shares for? I bought them for, uh, you know, $10 a share. What are they selling for today? $9. So that must be a real loser, right? Well, it'd be a loser if I'd put all my money in here and tried to take it all out there. But I don't put all my money in here. I spread my money out so that every month I consistently buy. And even if it doesn't come back to what I originally bought it at, I'm still way, way, way ahead. Okay, does that make sense? Now, most... Most people don't understand the stock market. They think there's a lot of risk in it. Very risky place to put your money. Let me tell you where it's risky. There is a risky place for the stock market. And then there's a very, very safe place for the stock market. And it all depends on time. According to this uh, report I picked out of the paper the other day, let's suppose we had five holding periods. One, five, 10, and 25 year holding periods. Suppose you took your money and stuck it in the stock market and took it out a year later. You stuck your money in the stock market, took it out five years later, 10 to 25 years. You understand that? Now we're going to compare the probabilities of making money, or I guess actually in this case is the probability of losing money, with different holding periods. Where does the average person who gets in the stock market, where do they, where's their usual holding period in the stock market? One year. It'll be one year if it's gone down probably be a couple of months, five years maybe. They're really not focusing for long term. They're trying to get in into a long term vehicle and make short term money. And therefore they end up making short term losses. Here's where the real risks come. Look at this. Probability of loss. If I'm investing in stocks, for instance, that means I'm buying IBM and Caterpillar and whatever stocks happen to be out there. If I if I do my one year, if I put my money in in the beginning of the year and take it out at the end of the year, I have a 35% chance of losing my money. But the longer I leave my money in there, I have 15% chance of losing, 5% chance, 0% chance of losing money over a long period of time. Now this, of course, is based upon, you know, uh, the past history. So I can't predict the future, but in terms of the way we had our past, from the, from the Depression, even from the early 1900s, there has never been a 25-year period of time in any, in any year you want to pick, from 1900 to 1925, from 1901 to 1926, from 1902 to 1927. You take any 25-year period of time from the beginning of this decade or this century all the way up to today, and there has never been a 25-year period of time where an investor lost money in the stock market. What, why is the, what's the secret there? See, these dips and ups and downs in the stock market, if I can spread them out long enough, eventually that stock market is going to have a consistent increase. Now, like I said, I'm going to make an assumption here that the future will be the same as the past, but I believe very strongly that it will. I don't know what might happen in the next five years. Perhaps the economy could tank. Maybe it'll tank for 15 years. Maybe it'll tank for 20. But I think more than likely, us Americans in our ingenuity will figure out a way for the values that we put our money into today will eventually come back within a 25 year period of time. So you don't invest your money on a short term basis. You basically have, you say, take the money out of my bank.